designed to take advantage of the force of gravity as the prime driver to move wastewater flow. I'm sure we've all heard the term, something flows downhill. Well, it's flowing downhill. Uh, the design insulation is dependent on maintaining the constant downward slope. The only thing that moves the wastewater is the force of gravity. A pressure sewer system, on the other hand, uses pumps. Uh, there's a grinder pump located at each property and a small diameter pipe that is buried just below the frost line. The grinder pump on each property macerates the solids in the wastewaters to very fine particles and then conveys it to either the central wastewater treatment system uh, or maybe part of another uh, collection system, part of a bigger gravity sewer system discharges into a lift station, a gravity force main, or a gravity uh, manhole as part of a system. So again, the, the, the solids are macerated, and because the solids are not large and you have the pump moving the solids, the pipe for a low pressure sewer system is much smaller diameter than you would see for a typical gravity sewer system. When we look at the design considerations, there are a lot of similarities between designing a gravity sewer system and designing a pressure sewer system. Uh, there are also a lot of differences, and I don't know if there's more similarities than differences, but some of the key similarities we have are, you know, what would you expect? The wastewater flow rates. What is the wastewater generated within the service area? The objective of any wastewater collection system is to move the wastewater from point A to point B. So that wastewater is going to be the same how that wastewater impacts the, uh, or uh, that, or how that wastewater is generated though can impact the design differences between a gravity sewer and a pressure sewer system. Also, when you're looking at the design considerations, you wanna look at the pipe materials. Many times they might be similar between a modern day gravity sewer system and a pressure sewer systems. Um, hydraulic, hydraulic parameters, looking at the velocity, the flow, the pipe size, and in the case of a gravity sewer system, the slope of the pipe, because that is what really maintains the proper velocity. And then regardless of what kind of system it is, there are gonna be some appurtenances within the sewer system. This is stuff other than the mainline sewer. Another consideration, and this is where you have a little bit of difference between a pressure sewer system and a gravity sewer system, is the alignment and the layout. They are laid out somewhat differently, and the alignment options do differ where there might be some advantages with the pressure sewer system in terms of the sewer system alignment and layout. So our wastewater flow rates, you know, as I mentioned, sanitary sewers are designed to convey the wastewater. And you want to design a system so you're conveying the anticipated peak flow rates. So you want to make sure that your pipeline is sized to produce the most wastewater that is going to be produced instantaneously, as well as any lift stations or the treatment plant that you might have. So some of the general flow definitions we have is the average daily flow. That is, as it says, the average flow within the service area, generally presented as a per resident uh, breakdown. Uh, wastewater is not generated on an average basis though. So that's just looking at what the flow is for the average day. But the wastewater flow within the system is gonna be driven more by the maximum day flow, the minimum day flow, the, what I got minimum day flow on there twice, or the instantaneous peak flow. And the instantaneous peak flow can sometimes be either termed the uh, peak hydraulic flow, the peak flow, the peak hourly flow, uh, but it's basically what is expected to be the peak flow going into the system. And that is really one of the critical components because you wanna make sure, regardless if it's a gravity sewer system or a pressure sewer system, you wanna make sure that the pipe is sized so you're able to convey all the flow. Rates and characteristics, pretty much the same between a pressure sewer system and a gravity sewer system. So you don't have a lot of variability here. Uh, there's one, one key thing that is different that we'll get to, but we're looking at three components that make up the total of wastewater flow in sewer systems. You have your domestic flow, and I categorize residential as well as commercial and institutional contributions within the domestic flow. This is your domestic component. This is generally your uh, wastewater part of the wastewater system. Then you have an industrial flow. An industrial flow is often broken out separately when you're designing a sewer system uh, for two reasons. One, an industrial flow's contribution to the system might not be as uh, steady or have the same sort of patterns that you would have 
with the commercial establishment and certainly not what you would have with the residential uh, population with household domestic flow. Industrial flow might be a lot of uh, instantane, very high volumes entering the wastewater system when, they're, when a facility is doing a wash down or something with the industrial process. Another thing that separates industrial flow from the domestic flow is the wastewater characteristics might be drastically different. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you know what's going in there and how it can impact the wastewater treatment process. If there are any chemicals or any other uh, constituents that could cause harm, or if not cause harm, at least have to be handled separately. So those are your two primarily uh, flow coming from a, a source, a, a business, a residence, or an industry. The third flow component is infiltration and inflow. So we kind of touched on this in the first part of the webinar where the infiltration inflow is extraneous flow, either groundwater or rainwater, that is not supposed to be in the wastewater collection system, but we know with gravity sewers, it's always gonna end up there. So as I say, this is clean water, groundwater or rainwater that enters the system and then it has to be treated as, a, uh, as, as basically as wastewater. Even though it was clean, once it gets into the pipe, it gets mixed with the domestic and industrial flow. It is now wastewater. So it has to be accounted for in there. So when we look at gravity sewer versus pressure sewers, that third component, the infiltration inflow, kind of comes into play because one of the advantages with the pressure sewer system is there's essentially zero infiltration and inflow. It's a closed system. Uh, it's also a system that's under the force of the pump so you really don't have any infiltration inflow getting into the system. Whereas with a gravity sewer system, infiltration inflow is known to be there. It's not, it may not be there on day one, but when you're designing a, a gravity sewer system, you have to account for the contribution component of infiltration and inflow. It's kind of understood that gravity sewer is gonna fail and at some point this extraneous flow is gonna get in there. So it becomes kind of a, a critical component when you're looking at quantifying your wastewater flows within the service area, uh, particularly on the infiltration and inflow when you're looking at um, gravity sewer system designs. So now we'll kind of go through the gravity sewer systems and how I kind of structured this is kind of a walkthrough of the gravity sewer systems, looking at the components and some of the basic design characteristics and then looking at the pressure sewer system. So the gravity sewer system, uh, you get, you know, these are your primary components you have. You have your sewer pipes, and that's going to consist of your mainline sewer. That's typically going to be about a um, 200 millimeter uh, mainline sewer. Laterals and branches are kind of very similar to the mainline sewer in that it conveys most of the flow. Uh, so you might have uh, the mainline sewer going on the street and on a cul-de-sac. It still might be a 200 millimeter line, but it might be designated as a branch or it might be called a mainline sewer. So it's, it's kind of like a grayish area between mainline and branch as I'm showing here. But then you also have larger diameter sewer. This is your interceptor or your trunk sewer. So as you have all your wastewater falling into the 200 millimeter sewer and then it, throughout the system, uh, the capacity of that pipe is going to become a limitation. Now, a 200 millimeter gravity sewer has a pretty large carrying capacity, but depending on the service area, you may have to add larger diameter interceptors or trunk sewers. And this is the, uh, the trunk sewer to bring the wastewater from the service area to the treatment plant or to the lift station. Also within the gravity sewer system, you got your appurtenances. Uh, the big one, manholes. Uh, you'll have those throughout the gravity sewer system. And then depending on how the system is laid out and the top topography of the area, you might have some lift stations. And if you have lift stations, you might have some force mains. So with gravity sewers, you have the pipe that is installed initially right below frost line at the highest point, but then it has to go a downward slope. And there becomes a point where it is no longer economical to dig a very deep trench, or it might be a safety concern that you don't want to dig a very deep trench for the gravity sewer system. So you would install a lift station that would lift the wastewater up to a higher standpoint and either convey it to another gravity sewer or in many cases into a force main. So the, the need for lift stations and force mains, pretty common in gravity sewer systems, but it will depend on the topography of the system itself. Hey, Keith. Yes, sir. Just, just to stop you here for a second. Uh, we've got a question in here. I thought it'd be a good time to, to, to break sure. it up. 
what is the formula behind your design method? The, um, well, let's see, let me jump what's, our, what's the E1 design um, method in, 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 in these flows? Well, I guess have we, well, I'll let you answer that first. Yeah, I'm sure if I, if I understand the correction in terms of design, the design method is uh, maintaining the proper velocities based on the slope. So uh, the common equation used for gravity sewers is the Manning equation, which, you know, you, you want to design the sewers for velocity. And then you have a couple, of, you know, uh, parameters that fill in that the roughness coefficient and then the hydraulic radius, which is the uh, hydraulic radius is kind of the the part of the wastewater that touches the circumference of the pipe. It's probably not the best way to explain it, but that's how I've always learned it. And then, you know, from there you get your slope. So the idea being that you want to maintain, um, here, let's see. See, if I knew the question was going to come, I would have organized these in a different order. <laughs> you want to maintain. Always, uh, always hard to, to, uh, <laughs> to predict. Yes, but at least I know the the slides I need are in here somewhere. So I'm just gonna okay. be jumping around. Why don't Keith, Keith? Why don't Why don't you just continue on, um, and then we we will get to that uh, that point because you're going to go through the design method for the low pressure, which I think that's the that's the question that's maybe being asked here. So oh yeah yeah, yeah. we're definitely going to hit the low pressure. So, so why don't we just go on with what you're doing there, and uh, and and then we'll get get back to that question. Okay. Okay. Oh, jump back. Jump yeah. back to where we were. When we look at uh, gravity sewer pipes, there's going to be a lot of similarity between the types of pipes you use in a newer gravity sewer system uh, and a low pressure sewer system. They're constructed of different materials based on the purpose, but mostly based on the time of installations. So on some older gravity sewer systems, you might see some um, vitrified clay pipe, some reinforced concrete pipe, pre-stressed concrete pipe, brick pipe and there are, I don't know if there's a lot of them out there but you go to some really large sewers particularly maybe some of the northern territories you might see some uh, gravity sewers that are built out of uh, tree trunks uh, probably not the best in terms of infiltration control but you have those materials now a newer modern day gravity sewer system is going to be uh, typically constructed of polyvinyl chloride high density polyethylene hdpe or a or cast iron and this is what we'll also see well pvc and hdpe we'll also see that with a low pressure sewer systems so the materials of construction for the most part when we're looking at newer systems are going to be the same between gravity now when we look at um the hydraulic parameters of the design for a gravity sewer system. As I was saying, uh, the, the key basis is you want to maintain the proper velocity within the, um, within the gravity sewer system. So you design around velocity. Uh, as I said, we had the Mann equation is most commonly used for gravity sewer design. So some of the coefficients in there is the roughness coefficient, which varies depending on the pipe and the age of the material. Generally, that coefficient would range from 0.03 to 0.015, with the lower end value being for smoother pipe, new pipe, and very well-constructed pipe. You might use a higher end value for older pipe if you're looking at an existing gravity sewer system and you want to add onto it. And you want to see, you know, do you have the capacity within there? So that's the, the general equation. So you kind of set the slope to maintain, given the hydraulic radius and the roughness coefficient, you set the slope of the pipe so that you maintain a consistent velocity. And even without the question, I realized my, I, I kind of got it in my head now that the order of the slides is out, off a little. So there's still gonna be a little bit of jumping around. So with the gravity sewer system, the goal is to set the pipe slope to maintain proper velocities. At low velocities, if the velocities in the systems are too low, you're going to have solid settling out. That's going to require some increased, increased cleaning. Also, the wastewater within there, when the solids settle out, could start to decompose. So you'll get some hydrogen sulfide uh, generation odors coming out, that um, um, rotten egg odor coming out of the manhole that you might see. That can usually be attributed to a low flow velocities and solid settling out. At high velocity, kind of have the same problem where the wastewater is moving faster than the solid, so you still might have a problem with the solids that are separated out. And depending on the pipe or the bend, you know, it could create some hydraulic concerns with erosion of the pipe, wearing down of the pipe with the higher velocities, or depending on the bends or any other 
uh, constraints within there, it could create some, uh, some forces uh, that you really don't want to have within the pipe. So let me see. Okay. So, you know, generally when you're looking at something, as I say, this is all really standard information that a lot of people probably don't know how to design a sewer anymore, like we did 50 years ago, because we're just so used to it that you size the pipe to maintain a minimum velocity of about 0.6 meters per second with the maximum velocity of 3.0 meters per second. And your slope is really going to be generally governed by regulatory guidance or requirements that depending on the pipe diameter, that is gonna set the minimum slope. So you would go in there, set the minimum slope, and then that minimum slope may change to a steeper slope if you have to avoid obstructions, or if you're going uh, down a downhill section, or it could vary. But generally, you're always gonna be keep maintaining these minimum slopes. So let me see how I jump around. So now let me jump back real quick. And when you're looking at hydraulic design of gravity sewer systems, there are a lot of graphs and tables that you can use to quickly give you an idea. But as I say, the carrying capacity of a 200 millimeter gravity pipe is pretty large. Uh, offhand, I don't know, I'm gonna say it's easily a couple hundred households, more than a couple hundred households. So you're pretty sure that most of the system will be 200 millimeter. It's just a matter of what you want your slope to be. And that will be governed by the minimum slope here. And another thing that is always considered is gravity sewers are not designed to fall full. So I said earlier that we want to design the gravity sewer systems for peak flow, but we want to size the pipe so that even at peak flow, the gravity sewer is not flowing full. Generally, when you start to see flows greater than 90% of the pipe diameter, that flow will be, become unstable and can cause surcharges and other hydraulic uh, constraints and problems within the system. So kind of some of the standards you look at if you're looking at the peak flow rate or the flow ratio at peak hour, uh, you would typically design that with a um, uh, depth of flow to diameter of pipe ratio of 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. If you're looking at that from the average daily flow, your diameter of the pipe diameter or your depth of flow to diameter of the pipe ratio would be about 0.4. So you're generally going to design the gravity sewer system. You're going to set the slope so that it flows somewhere between about a 0.4 and no more than a 0.8 uh, ratio on the depth of flow versus uh, the pipe diameter. So let me see if we get back on. Okay, so that's kind of how you would go through and design a sewer. As I say, a lot of it's going to be 200 millimeter pipe, and then it's just a matter of maintaining the proper velocities based on how the slopes are set. Now, the impertinences you're going to have within a gravity sewer system, manholes, there might be some terminal cleanouts. Depending on the system, you might have a terminal manhole, but you, in some cases, you might be okay just having a clean out in there. The service lateral going up to the house, and then depending on the uh, system itself, you know, some of the other appurtenances you may see are inverted siphons, junction boxes, as I had mentioned earlier, lift stations and force mains. So the big one, the big uh, non-pipe component of a gravity sewer system is the manhole. Manholes are required extensively throughout a gravity sewer system. You have them at junctions where you have multiple sewer pipes coming together. Uh, any place you have a change in sewer direction, a change in the pipe slope, or a change in the pipe size, you're generally required to put in a manhole. And then if you have a long straight run, uh, you still want to make sure that you have that manhole in there so that you can get access to the pipe uh, to maintain the system. So the maximum separation is generally going to be around 150 meters. You know, 150 meters is kind of the guidelines for a typical standard, but depending on where you are, you may have uh, requirements that are actually set by regulation and code that may have a value less than 150 millimeters. So if we look at a, a, a very long run of gravity sewer system, you would tend to have the uh, manhole every 150 meters, but we don't build sewer systems on a very long run. So you're always gonna have some junctions, you're always gonna have the change in sewer slope or the change in sewer direction. So more common value for the separation on manholes 
would probably be closer to maybe uh, 75 meters to the maximum of 150 meters. So when you're looking at the design of the system, you can't just take the total length of pipe and divide that by 150. A lot of other factors are gonna set where you have your manholes. And that's why when you're looking at the gravity sewer system, the manholes do become one of the uh, bigger components of the non-pipeline appurtenances. So here's a you know, typical layout and uh, you know, you're kind of running your 200 millimeter sewer with the constant slope and then you have a manhole, you know, manhole number two, manhole number three, where the pipe changes the direction uh, as well as a change in slope on the pipe. And then on the left hand side, you see manhole number one. That's where you have a manhole at the, uh, the juncture. So it's not a very long run, but in this example, you have a manhole, um, you know, very much less than 150 meters apart. Um, so alignment, as in, you know, I mentioned this, I think a couple of times, the minimum buried depth is determined by the location. So you'll start off maybe with the gravity sewer, one meter, one and a half, maybe two meters below grade. Uh, depending on your frost line. So it's going to be a little bit deeper in your northern regions. Uh, and then the sewer must be deep enough to receive flows from all connected sources. So you can start maybe one or two meters below grade, but then that pipe is going to, uh, the excavation, the installation of that pipe is going to be set by one, the slope required to maintain the velocity, but also low enough to uh, grab any connected sources. Generally, it will follow the natural drainage basins whenever possible. And you might get to a point where if you have too deep an excavation, as I mentioned earlier, where it's no longer economical or safe to keep digging to put in the uh, gravity sewer pipe, you would go with a lift station. Most common location for gravity sewer systems is at or near the center of the street. I think you know, this is driven primarily by the type of equipment you need to install the pipe. You have a large ex excavator, so you can't park that excavator on private property. So if you just drive that thing down the middle of the road, that's where you put the gravity sewer systems. Now, depending on where you are, you might be able to use some smaller equipment and get off to the side of the road. But generally, you'll see most gravity sewers at the center of the street. And they'll be laid at a uniform slope between the manholes with a straight line between one manhole and the other. You're not going to have any deviations within the pipe itself. If there is a deviation, either vertically or horizontally, there is required to be a manhole there. You also want to minimize any points of turbulence within the system to reduce, as I mentioned earlier, the production of hydrogen and the release of hydro hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen sulfide corrosion. And one of the other big factors in terms of laying out and aligning the sewer is one, you have to design for traffic loadings because the sewer system is generally located within the street, but you also have conflicts with other utilities. So if you have a gravity sewer system going in there and you come across a conflict with the water line, a gas line, a fiber optic, uh, you might have to lower that gravity sewer to a depth greater than you would have to based solely on the slope and velocity, just to get around those other obstructions. Now, if it's fiber optic or cable or something like that, you might be able to move that around. But if it's a gas line or a water line, that's really gonna control where your gravity sewer system is gonna be installed. And when you're looking at conflicts with water lines, the gravity sewer system has to be at elevation below the water line. So, and then there's cer certain separations that are mandated by code on how far it has to be down there. So as I say, even if you're designing uh, based on the slope and velocity and your design says you don't have to be down anything more than, um, let's say, two meters, three meters, other constraints may require that gravity sewer system to go down there because there's only so much you can do in terms of deviating that line because uh, you want to keep it in the middle of the road, plus you want to avoid putting in um, very expensive manholes. And these are just some of the pictures that illustrate kind of a, a gravity sewer system. As you can see, with that big equipment, that's why you have it going down the middle of the road. Um, you know, what, certainly one of the, uh, let's see, the upper left hand, I don't know if I can highlight a picture, but you can see this upper right hand picture where it's going down the middle of the road because you got the utility uh, pipes or the utility poles rather on the side of the street that you can't get around. So these are some of the things when you're laying out in the design of the gravity sewer system. This is what it looks like in many cases when you go into the uh, construction of the gravity sewer system. 
Now we look at pressure sewer systems and I'm kind of going to go through some of this a little quickly because I address a lot of it under the part one webinar, but I want to tie it in again, or at least call back to it because it does come down to how you design a system. But when we talk about a pressure sewer system, one of the primary differences between pressure sewer systems and gravity sewer systems is the on property components. With the gravity sewer system, the on property components are base, is basically the lateral. Everything else, the mainline sewer, the manholes, all the big cost associated with the sewer system is off property in the street. But with the pressure sewer systems, you have the on property components that consist of your grinder pump and your grinder pump basin, your service lateral, and then at the property line, you would typically have a lateral connection, and that lateral connection would consist of a check valve, an inspection port, and a shutoff valve. The you know, on-property components, again, if anyone was in the first webinar series, you'll recognize this picture. You're going to have your pump basin and your pumps. And within that basin, you're also going to have your liquid level controls and your pump controls, as well as the pump removal guidance. The pumps are either going to be progressive cavity in the case of an E1 system, or other manufacturers might provide a centrifugal pump. Why this is important is because the type of pump does impact the design process that you would go through. Uh, just real quick, how the system works, you got the wastewater that flows from the house into the basin. Uh, the grinding mechanism grinds up the wastewater and then the pump discharges it through the small diameter, typically about a 30 millimeter lateral going to the street. And that is your on property components. Now here we want to kind of, again, this is a callback to the first webinar uh, we did. We've got two types of grinder pumps, the progressive cavity and the centrifugal. With the progressive cavity pump, also known as a semi-positive displacement pump, you have a stainless steel helical rotor rotating inside a stationary stator. And after the wastewater is ground up, the rotation of the rotor within the stator creates a series of cavities that moves the liquid uh, to the discharge point. And it moves it to the discharge point in a plug flow type um, fashion. So it just moves from one chamber to the other, filling that volume and then pushing it along. So the volume going to the pipe is going to be determined by the rotation of that uh, rotor and the, the volume moving from chamber to chamber to chamber. And the advantage of this is it produces a constant flow rate only marginally affected by the system pressure. So no matter what the system pressure is, the discharge from a semi-positive progressive cavity pump is going to be near constant. We look at that compared to a centrifugal pump where the rotating impeller imparts the rotational energy to the pump fluid. This is great, going to be greatly affected by the system pressure. Um, and you know, one thing we want to keep in mind, if you recall from the first webinar, is a you know, this is a, a, a wastewater collection system. So we're talking hundreds of connections. And when we're looking at the pressure sewer system, that means a, a 100, 200, you know, a typical system might be, say, 300 uh, grinder pump basins on each property. Now these aren't lift stations, these are more like appliances, particularly in the case of an E1 system, where it's a one horsepower, uh, low power consumption um, pump, but you have 200 of them, 300 of them operating at different times throughout the cycle. So with the, road, so with the centrifugal pump, the system is gonna vary dramatically depending on how many pumps are on and where those pumps that are on are indeed on. And that means the system head is gonna change drastically. And that means the uh, total dynamic head within the system is gonna change. So here we can kind of see a comparison looking at the two types of pump curves where uh, A, the red line is the typical centrifugal pump curve and B is the progressive cavity near vertical pump curve that we get from a semi-positive displacement E1 grinder pump. And the advantage as you can see here is, and uh, let me uh, just interrupt myself, the horizontal lines going across, and this is just for illustrative purposes, uh, those are the number of pumps that are operating. So when you have more pumps turned on and off, that's going to be more flow going into the system. That's going to create a higher total dynamic head within the wastewater collection system. So you can see when you have few pumps on, with a centrifugal pump, you'll be operating on the far right-hand side of the curve, discharging more than you would at your best efficiency point. As more pumps go on with the centrifugal curve, then you will move up the pump curve to the left-hand side, uh, where your flow would drop down depending on the system head. So you can see the discharge from a centrifugal pump 
is going to vary greatly depending on what the system total dynamic head is. Compare that with a semi-positive displacement grinder pump from E1. No matter what that system head is, you don't have a lot of variability uh, on the pump discharge. So, you know, just for illustration purposes, you can see here that if we're down to one pump operating, we might see a discharge from the grinder pump at about 15, whereas if we get up to five, six, the discharge from the grinder pump, this uh, semi-positive displacement grinder pump is gonna be maybe 10, 11, 12. So you're gonna get a very uh, consistent discharge from the pump with the semi-positive displacement that you don't get with the centrifugal. And that's critical uh, from what we're talking about today and that it does impact the design of the system, which we'll see shortly. So moving off property, then we just look on the, I mean, I'm sorry, moving off, off the property to the off property components. Uh, once we get off the property, we got small diameter mains following the contours of the land with a shallow installation. Uh, typically this would be uh, maybe 100 millimeter pipe. Sometimes, you know, generally somewhere between 200, I mean, I'm sorry, 50 and 100 millimeter pipe for the low pressure sewer system. Uh, appurtenances depends on the layout, but you might have some air release valves or you might have some terminal cleanouts. You're not going to have that in every system, but it really, as I said, depends sort of on uh, the layout. Here with the pressure sewer system, the mains are often located outside or adjacent to the edge of the pavement in public right of ways. So you're able to move off the middle of the road. This is attributed a couple reasons. With a pressure sewer system, you're able to use horizontal directional drilling methods, or if you are doing an excavation, you don't have to dig that trench as deep, and you have variability in how you can deviate that trench both horizontally and vertically, so you have a lot of uh, flexibility in where the pipe lays. So you're able to move off the center of the road into either the center of the road, or I'm sorry, the side of the road, or in many cases, off the pavement completely, but still within the public right away. And when you're laying out a, the pipe network, you want the laterals, the branches, the mains, you can follow a winding path, but you wanna make sure that you don't have a lot of really long runs and you wanna avoid any abrupt changes. So I said, with the pressure sewer system, you can deviate horizontally and uh, vertically, but you don't wanna lay the pipe with a lot of 45 and certainly no 90 degree bends throughout there. You wanna make a nice slope, a nice moving um, installation. Where flow is different. So as you know, I mentioned earlier, wastewater flows are gonna be about the same through the system. Well, the fundamental component with pressure sewer systems is looking at the system peak design flow. Here we wanna design the flows to the maximum to be expected but the maximum occurs differently with a pressure sewer system than it does with a gravity sewer system. So you all might be familiar with a typical diurnal curve on a gravity sewer system where you have that big flow generated uh, early in the morning before everyone goes to work or school or early in the morning before everyone goes to work in school back in the days when we used to actually leave our home to go to work in school. Uh, and then when everyone comes home, you have that, um, again, that high flow. Whereas with the pressure sewer system, you have that basin in the front yard. So everyone might flush that toilet at seven in the morning before they take off to go to work. But that doesn't necessarily mean the wastewater is entering the system at that point. It will go into the basin and then it will sit there in the basin until the flow gets to a certain level that turns the pump on. So with pressure sewer systems, we, don't, we, we design for the maximum flow going into the system, but we account for the maximum flow differently. And that is based primarily on the number of pumps that are operating at the same time. Now, before I get into the details of that, let me just kind of run through some of the other components, uh, pipe sizing. You, 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 want, you want to arrange it in a branch network, very similar to what you might do with the gravity sewer system, but you don't want to think about it as because it's a pressure sewer that you can lay it out like a water system. You don't want any loops. You want to have terminal ends with everything going to a downstream location. You don't want wastewater looping through there. Uh, the branch layout provides a, predict a predictable minimum flow cleansing velocity. So you make sure that you maintain the flow throughout the system. And then the pressure sewer collection pipe should be sized so that you maintain the minimum flow velocity of two feet per second to prevent the sedimentation in the system. But you also want it large enough to handle the projected peak flow with minimum friction losses. And that minimum peak flow is gonna be based on the number of pumps that turn on at any given time. You also wanna design the system to keep the wastewater retention times as short as possible. 
So when you're designing a pressure sewer systems, you're walking that balance that you want to optimize the pipe diameter so it's small enough diameter so you have sufficient velocities so you don't have a lot of sedimentation in the system but you want the pipe to be sized large enough so you don't create any unnecessary friction losses which will raise your total dynamic head that the pumps have to pump against now going back to centrifugal versus um, low pressure if you do have those higher flows with the centri I mean, with the uh, semi-positive displacement pump, you're not going to have as big a uh, problem that you might have with the centrifugal pump because of that near-vertical semi-positive displacement uh, pump curve. Sewer pipes must be rated for 160 psi working pressure, and typically we would see an, uh, HDPE SDR11 or PVC SDR21 are the most common pipes. Uh, schedule 40, Schedule 26 PVC is also used. And I mentioned this, the mainline sewer is generally going to be between about 40 to 100 millimeters throughout the system. E1 did an evaluation of a whole lot of uh, low pressure sewer systems designs, not necessarily E1 systems, but just any design contract drawings, reports, bid tabs. Uh, we just evaluated a lot of low pressure sewer systems and looked, <clears throat> excuse me, looked at uh, what they had for the pipe. And I believe, I don't have it on top of my head, but I believe it was like 96% of the pipe in low pressure sewer systems based on a review of designs, bids, and reports, 96% of the pipe was 100 millimeters or less. And again, this is a small diameter pipe that can follow the contours of the land. So if you're looking at a small system where you have 200 home service, it might cons consists entirely a no pipe greater than 50 millimeters. But if you're looking at something with maybe 200 homes in it, you might see uh, more 100 millimeter pipe. If you're looking at a service area where you have, let's say 4,000 connections, then you might see some 200 millimeter pipe. But generally for the type of systems you're gonna be looking at, it's gonna be about 100 millimeters or less. Now, when we look at the pressure sewer systems, the probability method, is the way we design low pressure sewer systems using pumps with the near vertical pressure head discharge curves. Hey, Kate, uh, can yes. I just interrupt you for a second? What you're answering right now is I think the, an the answer to many of the questions that are out there, what is the formula behind your design method? So I just want to lay that out there. This is, Keith is just about to go over that right yes. now. And, and unlike, um, unlike uh, gravity sewer systems, it's not so much a formula as it is understanding the probability. So the probability method, which I guess we could say our formula is the maximum simultaneous operation. And this is used only for semi-positive displacement pumps because this is based on that near vertical curves. And what this does is it predicts the maximum number of pumps that would theoretically be expected to be operating simultaneously at any given time. Uh, this is based on numerous studies going back to the uh, formation of E1 and the development of low pressure sewer systems using semi-positive displacement pumps. E1 has recently completed an, a study looking at thousands of pumping, grinder pump connections uh, throughout the Great Lakes regions of the United States, primarily around Indiana and um, uh, Michigan. And where else am I? Yeah, Michigan would be the big one. And we validated that, um, you know, this maximum operation simultaneous is accurate. And how it does is it's at base, the system, bases the, flow, or the system flow is based on the assumption that each pump running will produce a near vertical flow rate. And what we do is we say we have that uh, simultaneous operation, that if you have one pump core connected, the maximum number of pumps that could be operating would be one, which makes sense. If you have, let's jump down the table on the right hand side, if you have between 19 and 30 grinder pump cores connected, the maximum number of pumps operating would be five. So now what's nice with this table, the simultaneous operation and the semi-positive displacement pump curve is we estimate the flow based on the maximum number of pumps operating. So if we jump down now to say 147 to 179 pump cores connected, the expectation is no more than 10 pumps will be operating at any given time. That means our expected maximum flow entering into the system would be 10 pumps, maximum of 10 pumps operating times 
let's say 11 gallons per minute coming from each pump of 110 gallons per minute going into the system. So that sets the flow that we have going into the system. And again, it's really based on the advantages of the semi-positive displacement curve where when the pump turns on, it's gonna discharge somewhere between eight and 12 gallons per minute. And then based on the simultaneous operation, we know depending on how many pumps we have in the system, that tells us how many pumps we're gonna be operating on. So then it comes down to your standard hydraulic uh, design where you want to optimize the system to keep the velocities high and the pressures low based on the flow. So you go through, and the way we do the system is we divide it up into zones where uh, it facilitates the selection of the pipe diameters and then the assignment of the zones kind of becomes uh, natural. So you start by assigning the zones based on the simultaneous operations. And wherever you have two junctions that come together, that sets a new zone. But for the most part, when you're looking at the zones, you'll have a zone that happens uh, a, a zone continues until the aggregate number of pumps expected to be operating simultaneously increases by one. So you start off with one zone and then you go through and then if you have two to three connections, so you increase your number of pumps operating simultaneously from one to two, then you name that zone two and you proceed down there unless you come to an intersection or juncture and then you make that a zone. So again, I, I really suggest, you know, this is just kind of the, the quick webinar version of it. But on our website, you can download the design assistant or just look on the website and it shows e1.com and it shows the, uh, the process. But basically you start with the layout and we'll start with one pump connected to zone one. Then we go at two more connections. So we have two to three pumps connected. So now we're in zone two. Then we move down, let's move down a little. So now we're in the four to nine. You can see we have 49 connections. And based on our table, you can see we've increased the number of pumps operating from two to three. So now we would designate that cluster right there as a zone. Then we proceed down from 10 to, well, if you look at the table, you can see we got 10 to 18 would be increasing the number of pumps operating from three to four. So that's gonna tell us that we wanna make that a zone. But at 17, we have a juncture. So we stop that zone at 17, and then we designate the next zone at that little cul-de-sac with house number uh, 18, 19, and 20. So then that becomes, where am I, one, two, three, four, five, zone five, and then we continue to proceed down. So here we're looking at 20 through 30, so that would be equate to the 19 to 30, which is five pumps operating simultaneously. So as we left the juncture, we now have another cluster where we have one additional pump operating simultaneously, and we call that a zone. So that's kind of the, the quick way you go through it, designating your zones. And then, you know, you can look at some, we have standard tables, and let me just increase this a little bit, where the design assistant will walk through, and N is the number of connections, and you recall from our table, N is the number of pumps operating simultaneously, and that is based on the number of connections. So you have a, if you have an N5, that is telling you that you have 19 to 30 connections in there. And then you can just kind of look at this table. And this is a real quick way to look at it is if I have an N5 and I go over and I look at a two inch diameter pipe, that's gonna give me a um, velocity of 4.87, a, a head loss of 3.97, not bad. But if I increase that to a uh, two and a half inch pipe, my velocities go down a little as well as my uh, friction losses. So I wanna find that sweet spot where I don't have too much friction losses that causes my uh, system to be at a higher total dynamic head, but I wanna maintain the velocities. So you see if we go to a three inch pipe, we're getting our velocity down at 2.24 feet per second. And it's getting in the uh, area where we wanna kind of avoid. So you can just kind of use this and again, that's the beauty of the semi-positive displacement pump and that near vertical curve is you look at the number of pumps operating simultaneously and that basically equates to a flow and it's gonna be constant. And then you can just say, based, you know, this table uses standard hydraulic parameter or formulas where you have your velocity and your hydraulic uh, or your, yeah, your total dynamic head and the friction losses within the head can then be determined for that particular zone. 
And then when we look at a pressure sewer system, some of the advantages that, you know, the upper left-hand corner, that's a, a grinder pump basin going in. So that's your big on-property component that we have to uh, consider. But then when you get off property, as I mentioned earlier, you could use horizontal directional drilling or uh, what I would either term trench, a low impact cut and cover or a trencher. Now your ability to use a trencher might be a little bit impacted the further you move up uh, the Canadian provinces, but there are some areas where you might better use a trencher or again, a, a, low, a, a much smaller uh, backhoe than you would with a gravity sewer system. And this allows you to move either to the side of the road, so you're not going on the middle of the road, you're not digging up as much of the road, you're not creating a big uh, uh, ha headache for the area, or you're able to move into the right of way off the road, but still in the public right of way. Sewer maintenance, real quick on this one, um, it's required. You know, it's required, it's, it's, it doesn't matter what kind of pressure or sewer system you have, either a pressure sewer system or a gravity sewer system, maintenance is required. You wanna maintain a good preventive maintenance program as well as a predictive maintenance. So you generally work through preventive maintenance all the way through the corrective maintenance because you wanna avoid that emergency maintenance. Now this is all I'm gonna talk about with this. This is just kind of uh, to set up one component of the next webinar where we're gonna be talking about the social cost, the um, triple bottom line, so life saver cost analysis. So within that discussion, that's where the um, operation and maintenance between a gravity sewer system and a low pressure sewer system really comes into play because it's driven primarily by cost. Let me jump back. So the sewer maintenance is required for any kind of system. So you wanna make sure you account for it. And that just goes to what's next. So the part three of the webinar, and I don't know if we have that set stuff in, but you know, you're certainly here when we get that established. Uh, that's the triple bottom line, a life cycle cost analysis. So you kind of work through, based on what you learned from our first two webinars, the first one a couple weeks ago and then this one today, gets you the engineering, the technical aspect of making that uh, selection on your, uh, your uh, sewer system options. Next time we'll talk about the triple bottom line, the economic impact between them, as well as the environmental impact and the social cost. That's the disturbance to the community. You're not tearing up the street with gravity or with low pressure sewer system that you might be doing with the gravity sewer system. So again, this is, you know, within our 45 minute uh, timeline, this is sort of uh, intended to show you why there are some similarities when you're looking to design a gravity sewer system and a pressure sewer system, there are also some pretty significant differences. And then when you're looking at a pressure sewer system, there are even differences in how you would design a pressure sewer system using semi-positive displacement pumps or design a pressure sewer system that would use um, uh, centrifugal pumps. And again, you know, the, the, the concern is with, with uh, you have multiple pumps, these pumps are only gonna operate on average, 20 minutes a day. So, so let's say you have 300 pumps within the system. You have these pumps coming on and off at various times throughout the day. Uh, one pump might come on and as minute another pump comes on, the first pump might turn off. So you have a very dynamic, total dynamic head within the pressure sewer system. The advantage with the E1 semi-pod displacement pump is that near vertical curve really minimizes that uh, concern. In fact, it eliminates that concern that you, when the pump comes on, it's going to discharge that. So with that, I think I did end up leaving about 10 minutes or so for questions. Okay, Keith, um, there's a few questions here. I think you kind of answered, but, but maybe do it formally. Can a low pressure system tie into an existing force main easily? <sighs> no, if, if you stopped at right before easily, I would say yes, it can. Um, it is going to really depend on the system. You know, the discharge, um, you know, we, we kind of got saddled with the term low pressure sewer system back when the EPA in the US kind of set this up, but it's really not low pressure. So uh, you'd, you'd have to look at what the uh, system of, or, or what the pump discharge capabilities at the system head would be for the low pressure sewer system versus what the expected pressure would be within the force main. So if your force main is at a, um, 
uh, pressure greater than 85 PSI, you probably won't be able to tie in directly. But you could definitely tie a pressure sewer system into a gravity main. And again, depending on what your pressures are within the uh, force main, you might be able to tie it into there. Uh, depending on what you're doing, it might be just a cleaner operation to run the pressure sewer main to the um, lift station wet well. And, and I think, uh, uh, Keith, I think really where we see a lot of this is really when the uh, low pressure ties into the gravity. That, that's really where we see the low pressure and the gravity kind of mixing, mixing there, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you have that, you know, your pressure and the gravity is, is not great at all. We have a, a very nice installation uh, outside of Detroit, Michigan, where they have a gravity sewer system that becomes surcharged. So the, the, the wastewater comes out of the manholes. And one of the problems that this created was it was uh, wastewater was backing up into the basements of the household. So they installed on, uh, I think it was like 16 houses on a street. They installed a grinder pump, the E1 grinder pump basin on each property that discharged into the gravity sewer. So even right. though the gravity sewer was surcharged, but the pump still had the uh, pumping capability to overcome that pressure. But discharging into a straight gravity sewer is never. Is never. Um, and I think this answers the next question, really. Can end users have centrifugal units in the same system designed for semi-positive displacement? What will happen? Well, again, it's a pressure thing, right? We've got to take a look at the pressures that are involved. And will we damage the centrifugal? Or will the uh, positive displacement pump uh, overcome the overall system, correct? Generally, if you, you know, I, I would not recommend um, a mixed system. You know, I might get in trouble from corporate when I say this, you know, if you go pressure sewer system, decide what you want to go with, but you don't really want to mix them. Uh, and it doesn't hurt this uh, semi-positive displacement E1 pump as much right. because we're always going to discharge that volume. Yes. Whereas the centrifugal pump might be deadheaded because the uh, pressure created by the uh, SPD pumps would create a higher system head that it can't overcome. That's correct. So we're probably going to be the ones that are, that are um, over-pressurizing the centrifugals, if anything. Yeah, and, and we actually, when, it, when we do see those mixed systems, uh, we, we find that the installation of E1 grinder pumps actually improves the overall performance of the system because the semi-pause displacement pump in action creates what we term a soft cleansing velocity. The, right. the, you know, it's going to push it through. It's going to push through. Even, even if we start to collect and make a smaller diameter, we're going to increase those velocities and push it through. Yeah, it all falls down to the Q equals VA. So if you have stuff settle out, you're just going to reduce your A. Your Q is the same, so your V is going to increase. Your V is going to, got it. Uh, two more questions. My concern is the impact of system failure, mainly pumps. Is there any mitigation measures in the design to accommodate potential failures? What, you want to answer this, or do you, or do you want me from, uh, from the John Brooks Right. Well, I, I would say, I, I definitely want you to follow up with it, but I would say, uh, you know, the advantage of the E1 system is, uh, if, you're, if, if this question was, if, you know, we talked about in the first webinar, the E1 pump was developed by a group of engineers from General Electric. So we have this pump that is designed and manufactured with a uh, appliance mentality. So we don't really anticipate there aren't a lot of big problems. Now, there are some, and yeah, Stephanie, if you could really kind of address it from the John Brooks side. Well, what, what I see is in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a standard centrifugal large big pump station, one of those pumps goes down, you know, you've only got another pump there sitting around. Uh, here with a, with a uh, low pressure, just there's many pumps and it's just really one location that goes down and uh, John Brooks would have, uh, have, have these pumps on the shelf and obviously uh, you guys do too. It's not like, you know, a, a, a 40 horsepower uh, submersible that's gonna be, you know, four to six week delivery. The, the delivery on these is like you said, a commodity delivery. Exactly, and, and, and you know, as you point out, if one pump does go down, it does not impact any other part of the system. Right. And another thing too, when, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it that way, Stephen, is when we're looking at uh, centrifugal versus low pressure sewer system, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, a centrifugal system, because the pressures are going to vary greatly, it may require either different types of centrifugal grinder pumps or customization on the impellers. So if you have a pump goes off, it's not a matter of plug and play. You got to go find what pump failed and then what size do I got to replace it with and do I got to do anything on the impeller? That's right. D1 makes one pump. Yeah, one hydraulic. Final question. I guess we're just under the line here. How are connections at junctions made? Uh, with why any need for thrust blocks? Uh, 
you, you might know what you see up there, but I generally don't see um, thrust blocks. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we typically don't see it. I, the, I guess you, there's, from a conservative standpoint, there's no reason you can't, but usually the backfill will be sufficient. And then, yeah, it could be uh, depending on how your pipe is installed. Uh, usually it's just a, kind of a, 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 a T. You could have a Y, but generally a T is sufficient. We see most cases. And, and, and E1 slash uh, John Brooks, when we go through the design, we normally put in where we would expect to have these clean out locations, uh, just in case there are, there are any issues. It's all part of the design, correct? Yeah, and that's one of the key things, as I mentioned. Um, you know, certainly I can only call it so much that if you look at our design manual or uh, online or, or thing, we do have, we do provide some guidance on where you might need an air release valve or where you might, you know, where you might recommend a, um, a clean out. And, you know, I didn't mention it, but I know we have some installations and I, I want to say Australia or New Zealand, where they tend to have a lot of isolation valves throughout the system. That way they can isolate certain neighborhoods or certain streets. So, you know, that's something you could consider. It's not required, but it's certainly something that can be considered. And Ewan and John Brooks can work with anyone on, you know, what we see and what we, what we might recommend. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Keith. Really appreciate it. I learn something new every time. It's a good thing. And I appreciate everyone uh, for attending. What we will do is uh, we'll meet back here two weeks today uh, for the final three of three of the uh, presentation. And in the meantime, in the next day or so, uh, you'll receive a, a link as usual, like all webinars, which will link you into the, uh, the, the um, YouTube uh, of this um, uh, of this uh, presentation, and then uh, you'll also get the new invite and uh, give, send us any questions if you have any. And I think we answered pretty well all the questions today. I appreciate it. And, and thank you, Stephen, for allowing me to do this. <laughs> no problem, Keith. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>